Hey guys, I am so glad to have you tuning in to FC Online today and uh, happy Father's Day to all of our dads out there. This is actually my dad, Dr. Ron Stewart. Dad, happy Father's Day and thanks for joining me today. Oh, glad to be here. And if you don't know, dad's a pastor and has pastored five different churches. He's written a book. He uh, was the president of the Tennessee Baptist Convention at one point and uh, he was actually the first one to hear God say, plant a church in Maryville. And it was his leadership at his previous mm -hmm. church that really funded the beginning of FC. And so you mean so much to this community and to this church. And um, this uh, past April, you celebrated 50 years in ministry. So congratulations. Oh, it's, uh, it's been quite a journey. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you're, you're also the father of four and the, and the grandfather of nine children. So that's pretty impressive. Yeah, but, you want to talk about them? Uh, we, don't, no. we don't have time. Okay. We don't want to bore the people All tuning right. in today. But yeah. um, what's most impressive is that new goatee that you've got uh, today. So Been we're working hard on that. Working now. hard. You could actually be a youth pastor now with that, you know. Uh, uh, thank you for that warning. <laughs> for that warning. That's awesome. I, I thought it would be great on Father's Day. It'd be special for me, you know, to have a conversation with dad uh, about being a dad and specifically what the Bible calls being a blessed man. And so if you're watching today, my guess is that you'd be in favor of God's blessing in your life. You'd, you'd like mm -hmm. to be happy. You, you'd like to be prosperous. All those things sound great and wonderful, but I think the tension for many dads, uh, many men in general today is that they're not very happy. And a lot of men think happiness is, is, is just one week out of the year when we're at the beach on vacation. And apart from that, life just kind of feels like a grind. Uh, and so we just kind of work hard. We try not to make our wife very uh, unhappy or angry and hope our kids turn out not crazy. And uh, for a lot of men watching, I think the demands at work put so much pressure on them that they just kind of feel stressed out. Uh, they don't really know how to fix their marital problems. So they might be hopeless today and, and they don't know if they're being a good dad or not. So they just kind of feel lost. So for many men today, I think, you know, they tend to think that they're feel stressed out. They feel hopeless and maybe even lost. And that's a tough place to be, but I wanna tell you today that thankfully the Bible has answers. The Bible has a, a, a direction for you today. And we've been in a series that we've called, I, I, I Got You. And the idea is that no matter how difficult things are in your life, God says, I got you. So we've been looking at various chapters in the book of Psalms. And today we're gonna to be in Psalm chapter one, and we're gonna see two kinds of men. And the writer of Psalms says that there's the, the man that lives by the word of God, and there's the man that lives by the word of the world. And the man that lives by the word of the world is headed for destruction. Uh, but we learn that the man who lives by the word of God is steady, happy, and prosperous. And so, you know, if that sounds like what you'd like to experience in your life, I think today is gonna be helpful for you. And hearing from dad and, and this conversation, uh, I think is gonna be great, but we're gonna start in Psalm chapter one. And so let's read this together where it says this. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Mm -hmm. Well, dad, he starts off by saying, blessed is the man. So mm -hmm. what, what does it really mean uh, for a man to be blessed? Well, the one thing that all of us have in common is that, uh, that transcends all races and all ages, all cultural ethnic distinctions is everyone wants to be happy. Yeah. We all want to be there. And the problem is we just don't know where to go. And so mm -hmm. we look in the wrong places and we can't find it. Yeah. So you have to define it and understand it, happiness is an emotion. Hmm. And uh, you may be happy and have cancer. Yeah. You, know, you, you may be, uh, be sad and just want a million dollars, you know. And, uh, so 
it, it lies to you. Uh, but Webster says it's a feeling of great pleasure, contentment, joy, fulfillment, satisfaction. That's what we're all looking for. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Beatitudes, Jesus lays out all, all of the Beatitudes that you preached about so well a few weeks ago, says it begins happy. You want to be happy? Mm-hmm. You want to have happiness? This is what you do. And he lays it out, you know, uh, and talks about being poor in spirit and mourning and, and the meek and the hunger and thirst after righteousness and the merciful and be pure in heart and be the peacemakers and, and you'll still be persecuted. Yeah. Uh, and so even you have, whatever that feeling is, you can still have the happiness uh, uh, that God wants. So if, if there's something down deep inside of you that says uh, there has to be more to life than what you're fe- feeling right now, or experiencing right now, then it just might be that you really haven't found that source of happiness uh, in your life. And I love what Jesus said one of my favorite verses is, uh, <clears throat> it's in John. He said, I came that you might have life. The reason why I came is so that you might have life and have it more abundantly. That includes a, a, a lot of things. The primary purpose for his life and ministry, Jesus said, was to teach us how to live a blessed life, which is a happy life, an abundant life. And Webster says the word beatitude means perfect blessedness or perfect happiness along the way. I think for me that this, that, that idea of happiness right here really shows us that happiness is possible. You know, not only is it possible, but Jesus wants us to experience it. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of, a lot of times men might think that God doesn't want them to be happy. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's really just like you were saying, we have the wrong mentality of happiness and we, we don't think God wants us to be happy, but we just have the the whole concept of, of happiness really all messed up. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think this happiness is not just for a moment. uh, It's not just for, you know, on our vacation, but this is continual happiness. It's not just a feeling. It's, it's really uh, rooted in our, our, our relationship with God and it it transcends uh, emotion. Like you said, Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's, that's awesome. Then the the writer talks about uh, the things that we should not do next. And so if you want to be successful, successful, if you want to be happy uh, in life, he says in verse one, essentially that we need to be intentional about our relationships. And so we've got to be wise about who we listen to, who we hang out with and, Mm -hmm. and uh, who we essentially live life with. And so uh, he says, don't walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners and don't sit in the seat of scoffers. So explain what he actually means there with the walking, the standing and the sitting. Well, if you want to live a happy life, you don't walk near the wicked. Mm. And what, when you walk near somebody, then you can tend to hear them and you get their advice. And so you hear the advice coming from them. And so you don't, don't walk around those people and listen to their conversations because you'll learn how to do the wrong things. He said, do not stop and stand by them and become a part of their lifestyle. If you start hanging out with some people, then eventually you're going to adapt some of their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. He says, don't sit down with them and become one of them before long. You're the one that the parents are saying, don't hang out with people (laughs) like that. You see the downward progression? Yeah. You just kind of walking by casually and see it. And, and it's a downward progression. First, you walk near them. Then you stand by them. And eventually you sit down and become one of them. Yeah. And if you do those things, what the, the psalmist is saying is you're going to lose your happiness. Yeah. So that walk is kind of how you live your life. It's and, your lifestyle. And are you, you know, listening to that um, advice from, from that group of people? So a good question would be, who are we like listening to? What did, what, what kind of people are we getting advice from? And, and that standing, it sounds like what you're saying is, you know, is that idea of participation, you know? So now I'm kind of standing around and I'm kind of, uh, you know, listening and I'm kind of beginning to participate with uh, this, this certain group of people. I mean, I think a lot of people, you know, they go to work and they're around people that they might consider ungodly, but they don't have to participate in their actions and in their, their attitudes. And so you've got to be able to be willing to stand alone, uh, uh, alone at work, stand alone at home, stand alone even at, at school sometimes. And, and so to sit, really what you're saying is like, now we're, we're finally putting our trust in these people. We're actually participating and, and we're, we're with them. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we're, we're actually you know, trusting in what they say and trusting in 
their ideas and, and, and making, it, making them our own. And those, those things can negatively influence and, and really lead us astray. Yeah, what, what you may remember me telling you this as a, as a boy growing up, but you tell me who your friends are and who you're hanging out with and who you're sitting with and who you're talking to, and I can tell you your future. Sure. Because whether you like it or not, what the people you hang around with, they're throwing ideas and opinions and, and emotions mm -hmm. and thoughts into your mind that you will consider mm -hmm. uh, when you're by yourself and it will begin to influence your life. And therefore, you allow those kinds of people to help shape you into the man or the woman that you're going to be. Yeah, it's almost like we just start mimicking behaviors and reactions and and then, you know, when, when we're sitting in that seat, we're putting our trust in their advice and in their way of life. And uh, that's a very dangerous uh, place for us to be. Yeah. Um, so in verse two, he transitions to now, he says, here's what you're supposed to do. Right. And uh, he, he basically says, be committed to God's word. And so he starts by, by talking about the law of the Lord. And the law of the Lord is not just the Old Testament law. He's really yeah. talking about the whole Bible here. Mm -hmm. And so elaborate on that. Why is that important? Well, since it's Father's Day, let me put it in a, the, the picture of, of a father. Uh, a father has some definite responsibilities. Uh, he is a protector of his family, the protector of his children, uh, simply because he's bigger. If someone's, uh, you say someone's climbing through the window in, in the kitchen, Mike, and go, go check it out, would you? You don't do that. Why? <laughs> because um, as a man, you're the protector, Right. And so you have to protect your children from the wrong kinds of people, the wrong kind of kids. Mm. And so you say, and I've told you and the other, t other three, I've said, you know, don't hang around with that person. I don't mm. want you hanging out with them and all that. So he provides and, and then he, he, he provides for them. And the provision is, you know, physically, emotionally, spiritually, all of those ways. Uh, you provide for your family. You want to give them the best things, the right things to help them to be able to develop their lives in the direction where they can be more godly and, and more understanding of who God's word is. And then you prepare them. You prepare them for the world. The role of a parent is to release your children. The role of the parent is I'm going to prepare you that that day when like the bird, you know, that you push that, that little one out of the nest mm. and now you're on your own because one day they will be on their own. Mm. Uh, and so you have to prepare them for that day. Train up a child in the way that he should go. All right. Because he will go. Mm -hmm. She will go. And you need, need to understand that. Uh, kids don't come with an instruction book. And even if they did, you'd need a thousand. If you have four kids, you'd need about 10 different books. I don't look at the instructions anyway. So. No, <laughs> but uh, they don't come and they're all unique. And that's why God's given us so much in the Bible about raising kids. I mean, it's all throughout the Bible. Uh, there's just so many, many things and, and, and how to treat our spouses. And, and the problem is most Christians are either simply not reading it or they're not applying it to their lives. Yeah. But the Bible says the blessed man, which means the happy man, is a person whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. Hmm. He loves the word of God. Yeah. Uh, and he learns from the word of God. And then he lives the word of God in front of his children, in front of his family and his friends. And the reason why some of us lose our happiness is because we ignore or we simply don't understand the word of God that's been given to us. The Bible teaches you uh, how to treat your wife. And, and, and I, to me, the Bible has taught me this, that the best thing you can do for your children is to love their mother. Mm -hmm. Because there's something about the way that the, the man treats his wife, that the kids just sit there and look. And, and when, when they see you kissing your wife, they go, oh, that's terrible, dad. But down deep inside, that gives them a built-in security hmm. that is going to last them throughout every experience that they have uh, in your life. So, so it sounds like you're giving all the men permission to kiss their wives today. And so is that, is that what you're saying? Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure I couldn't stop them. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I love how he says this. So delight, he delights yeah. in the law of God. So he's, 
He's loving it. And, and I think there's a fear for, for guys because a lot of guys just say, I don't like to read. And I, I think it's almost become like a lie that we believe because in high school, we didn't like to read or in college, we didn't like to read. Mm -hmm. And so I was never a big reader in high school and, yeah. and not really much in college either. And, and, and I think that the, what, what changed for me is when I really started to experience the power of God's word, because it, it wasn't just me mm -hmm. looking at the Bible as like a textbook or like a history book that I've got to read. It was more like, okay, let me open this up. And, and after some consistency being in the word and really beginning to understand it, it was, it was like all of a sudden I was experiencing the power of God in my life. I could, I could taste it and, and I was longing for it and God was changing me. And, and uh, yeah, he says, he says he meditates on it night and day. And so to me, that was like, that's a little intimidating. I don't know if I can give that much attention, but I think what he really means is all throughout the day, I'm thinking about it. What I read in the morning comes to my mind in the afternoon. You know, I'm thinking about this. I'm thinking about a message I heard. Um, I'm memorizing scripture, which I think is a lost art today. A lot of yeah. people just don't memorize the word of God anymore. But I think the more we memorize it, the more we, we I'd, I'd rather my kids memorize one verse a year than make them read the whole Bible. Because if they're just reading everything just to get through it, it's not helpful. Yeah. Um, they really, if, if we can memorize it, it's gonna encourage us, uh, it's going to challenge us, and it's gonna keep us on the right path in yeah. so many ways. Well, we're talking about happiness. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're talking about what, what everyone wants, everybody is seeking after. And if I told you, I've found the secret. Mm. I, I can tell you where to go and you can learn the secret for you reaching your ultimate goal in life, which is happiness, then you'd meditate on it, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. You would go to that book. And I think maybe some people just really don't believe that what God says here in this book about, about salvation is absolutely true and about how to treat your wife and how to raise your children. And those are the keys to happiness. And some people have fallen for the lie of the devil and he is the, the, the father of lies saying, well, all you need to be happy is more money. Mm. All right. But the only ones who believe that are those who don't have it. So uh, happiness is it's found in God's word and in God's will and doing it God's way. And if you follow that, you're going to have to read the Bible because if you don't know the directions, then you won't know what to do in situations, yeah. but you have to learn how to meditate day and night. It just means like Paul says, pray without ceasing. Mm -hmm. well, it doesn't mean you're praying all the time, but at any instant, at any moment, uh, when anything you're going through in life happens and all of a sudden, then God gives you that, that memorized word that you were talking about that you have. And you said, this is what I need to do. Mm -hmm. And so you don't have to take time to pray about it because you've already heard God's answer to it. Yeah. I think when it comes to meditating, um, we're a little intimidated by that. Um, but I think really that just means we're really just kind of not just looking for information. We're looking for more transformation. So we're we're, you know, we're, we're thinking about one verse, one phrase, and that's maybe for five or 10 minutes. And as we're thinking about it, maybe our mind goes and gets distracted, but you know, we're conscious, okay, my mind just got distracted. I want to come back to this verse and, and, uh, you know, just, just developing that habit of thinking about a verse for five or 10 minutes a day without TVs on, without, you know, everything distracting us could, could be a huge habit that starts to de-stress our life and starts to you know, even relieve anxiety in, in our life. And so mm -hmm. I think that's, that's another huge part of what, what he is finding delight in and happiness in. Yeah, um, yeah. and I think the meditation thing is what, what the way I see that and what I hear with that is that I'm reading God's word and as I'm reading that word, then somebody's name comes up from that word. Mm. And I start thinking about a conversation I had with somebody or an experience that I had during that day. And now I'm meditating on, on, on that situation. And now I'm applying that word to that circumstance and saying, you know, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Yeah. Maybe I should have done something else. And so meditating means it's always in your mind. And whenever you need that, it's going to come to your mind. And, and he says, give no thought to what you're going to say in that day yeah. because I'm going to give you the words and, and God allows us then to be able to bring that word out and apply it to whatever circumstance in life. 
One of the things that I think helps me when I'm, I'm going through some scripture like this is really just to kind of ask three questions. Um, and three questions that are, you know, read a passage and then I ask, what, what do I learn about God in this passage? And then kind of write some things down that we learn about God. I learned about his faithfulness or his love mm-hmm. or his whatever. And then what do I learn about mankind? Uh, you know, what, what am I learning about people? Well, uh, you know, unrighteous people make bad decisions or whatever it is. And then finally, I, I, I ask, how do I need to apply this to my life? And so in what ways do I apply this to my life? And a lot of ways that gives me a little direction um, with, with meditation or, or, you know, just kind of that study of scripture. And I, I think a lot of people don't practice this, but for the psalmist, it was a practice that brought him happiness. And he says, you and I can have that as well if we do it. Um, so uh, if you guard your relationships and, and make the word of God a priority, you're going to begin to experience some amazing blessings here. And so uh, some of the blessings he talks about um, mm-hmm. is, is, first of all, being uh, planted. Uh, in other words, being firmly established here. Um, he talks about uh, bearing fruit uh, in its season. And uh, he also talks about being prosperous here. So these are great benefits. Elaborate a little bit on, on just, you know, what, what are some of these, um, uh, what's the benefit of being firmly established? Well, it, it's, it's consistency. Uh, how, how long does it take you to lose a 40 year witness mm. testimony? One second. One second. You can lose it like that. You can lose it like that. And the way you maintain a heritage or a legacy and pass it on to your children, your grandchildren is from the beginning to the end. Mm -hmm. And you can, you know, the the last last year of your life can be a destructive time for your entire life along the way. And so he says, we're like trees planted by the streams of water. You're not going to be lost because the water is going to make you stronger. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the water represents normally the the Holy Spirit. You know, it's going to give you the strength you need along and it will yield its fruit in season. Mm -hmm. So what you're doing today in meditating and living and loving and learning God's word, today it may not be a benefit to you. But somewhere down the line, and I've seen this so many times uh, in my life, that word is going to come up and, in a situation and, and you don't have time to pray. You've got to respond. It's an instantaneous thing. And that word's going to be there for you to be able to deal with that circumstance of that situation uh, in the way that God would have you to. And then it says, whatever he does then will prosper. Okay. But God cannot bless what you will not do. Mm. And whatever he does, whatever that righteous man who's meditating on the word does, God's going to bless. So you have to be willing to do some things in order to be able to put God's word into practice and make it, make it turn into life, which will be the life-changing word yeah. that will change somebody's life. We always say there's God's part, right? And yeah. then there's our part. Right. And then there's the other person's part. So if I'm trying to help somebody, I've got to do my part. That person has to do their part. We know and trust that God is going to do his part. And I love this imagery though, because being firmly established, you know, we we just hit, we're in a crazy time in America and so much is happening um, in in COVID-19. And, you know, what, what, what I love about the verse is it reminds us that when everybody else is panicking, the, the tree that is firmly planted um, mm-hmm. is steadfast, is steady, you know, and it's because the roots are deep, the, the, the river is, is close by, the, the Holy Spirit, God's word is, is with us, mm-hmm. feeding us. And, you know, it's really not until a storm kind of hits your life that you can even really tell if you're firmly established or That's not. Right. You may walk around thinking you're fir- firmly established, but when that trial comes, then you actually, you actually know yeah. Um, and, and, and you're able to kind of, you know, see where you're at. Yeah. And you and I and our family, we've gone through some, uh, some pretty bad storms. Yeah. And, uh, and that's where you find out where your faith is. Mm. That's, you, know, you can talk about how much you love the Lord when the sun's shining. But when you go through the storms of life and everybody's going to go through them, when you do that, then that's when you find out what you really believe about God. Mm-hmm. And whether or not God's word is true. And I can tell you that uh, throughout all we've been through, uh, God's grace is sufficient. Mm. 
Mm. All right. And some people would say, well, to go through all of that, um, you know, I don't know that I could go through that. I don't know that God would. Well, no, because you don't need God's grace Mm. right now. But when you go through that, God gives you whatever grace you need to get through whatever storm there is in your life. And if you're that one who has meditated upon the word of God and you've been planted by the water, by the river, then God gives you the grace Mm -hmm. to be able to face any circumstance, any situation in life. Yeah, when, when things are great, we feel like we don't need God's grace or, you know, of course we do. Um, but it's, it's those, those moments that are really tough where we hopefully, you know, feel and know that it, it is God that we need. Yeah. And, and it's in those moments too, I think, when we're, we, we always want instant uh, gratification. We want instant fruit. Uh, we started to go to, to church, you know, but my marriage still didn't mm-hmm. click. You know, yeah. we went, well, how long did you go? Well, it was a couple of months. Yeah. Well, are you kidding me? That's it? I mean, you're talking about years of being in church, years of studying the word of God. And Mike and I still, you know, have issues. And so that's not a quick fix. And so I love how it says the fruit will be yielded in season. Mm -hmm. So the only way you can bear fruit is when you abide in the Lord and in the right season, you're going to see that fruit. It's not going to be um, immediate. Yeah. You can't say, boy, I'm hungry. I'm going to plant a seed of corn out there and hopefully we'll have corn for breakfast in the morning or whatever it is. Uh, You can't do that. Uh, and, and so it's this, this season, you've got to plant, you've got to water, uh, you, you've got to trust. Uh, but most people are just come to the Lord when there's a storm and they want a miracle. Mm. Oh, he's a miracle working guy. We want a miracle. Well, uh, what, what you're really wanting and needing in order to find happiness is a day by day mm-hmm. by day by day time. You build up that, that mm-hmm. strength. You build up your faith. And when you face those difficult things, now you're ready to go. Now, now you understand and now God's word comes washing over you like the waves. You know, grief to us uh, comes like waves. It's a wave and, and then it goes out and then the next day the, another wave comes in mm-hmm. and, and hits you again. But when those waves are coming, you, 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 you rely upon God's word and then you find out whether or not you believe God's word word or whether or not you're just preaching or teaching yeah. God's word. And, and I think the imagery here is when that wave comes, that storm, you know, you can be like the chaff, which, you know, blows in yeah. the wind yeah. um, because it's not rooted. It's not planted. It's not firmly established yeah. like the tree is. Yeah. And so what is chaff? It is separated, right? Mm-hmm. The, 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 just a chaff is separated from the meat of, of the seed. Uh, and so you're, you're separated from God. You're separated maybe from a spouse, mm-hmm. separated from your family, separated from the church, separated from, from everything. Yeah. And, and so if you're not careful, that's what storms will do to you. Yeah you don't have any anchor, if you don't have deep roots down in the word of God, then when the, when the storm hits, you end up being separated from those things that you love the most. And I think that's really the point here is, mm-hmm. is just like chaff is separated from the grain, he's saying the ungodly will one day be separated from God and, and face the judgment of God. And the result yeah. of the ungodly life is going to lead to destruction. Yeah. Um, and during these difficult seasons of our life, and maybe there's some folks at home going through some difficulties right now, you're gonna learn whether or not you're planted by the river. But the good news is you can begin that planting today. You, you can begin the habit of, of reading God's word. You can begin uh, to, to connect back in church and connect with God's people and, and begin to realize that happiness is not something that happens to you, just like, oh, happiness showed up today. No, happiness is something that you choose. And so even in the midst of that storm, you, you can choose to be positive. You can choose to uh, focus on the, the fruit that God is giving to you. Um, and so that result of a godly life is that in verse six, he says that God is gonna know the way of the righteous, which is another great benefit of this lifestyle. You're gonna know, God's gonna know you, not just like, oh yeah, I know about that guy, Ron Stewart. No, there's going to be a personal relationship there. Like a, like a father knows a son mm-hmm. or a father knows a daughter. He's going to know us, which, I mean, that, that's so encouraging, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, ab- absolutely. And, and what it says there at the end, but the, but the way of the wicked will perish. That word perish means will be lost. Yeah. 
and not just lost spiritually, but it'll be lost. Uh, his, his way, the way of the wicked, the life of the wicked is going to be lost, his lifestyle, as well as uh, at the end, uh, spiritually. Uh, but, but God is, is able to be there for us if, if we are able to get into the process and not just think that uh, just uh, some, some little prayer somewhere is going to make a difference. Mm-hmm. It is day by day by day by day. It is a journey. Mm-hmm. When we're saved, we begin a journey with the Lord. Mm-hmm. And in that journey, there's going to be good times and bad times, and uh, it's going to be good relationships and bad relationships, but we have to maintain that relationship with the Lord because the happiness that we all are searching for, we all say we want, I think it's almost a byproduct. Yeah. It's, you, you can't go out here, I'm gonna go out and find happiness. Well, you're not gonna find it that way. But when you do the things, when you follow through with the Beatitudes, when you follow through with the fruit of the Holy Spirit, uh, love, joy, peace, long suffering, generous, all those things, then guess what happens? Those, those are the fruits mm-hmm. of being able to follow after God and that's where we get our strength from. And you're talking about a journey. Now, one of the things that a father does is he comes alongside his, his wife, he comes alongside his kids and he helps them on that journey. He helps them you know, with this process of, of uh, being connected to the word and God's church and those kinds of things. And, yeah. and I think you know, for me, you were a dad that was you know, there sometimes making me go to church. You were a dad that um, <laughs> you know, uh, taught the word of God. Yeah. And, and so I you know, was always given that godly counsel whether I wanted it or not. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the long-term effect of that is, is just, I think, a fruitful, yeah, you know, focused and, and, and hopefully in the will of, of God. But not every guy, not every family has that. And uh, mm-hmm. I thought it would be helpful for people to kind of hear a little bit about your story because you didn't have that kind of father. No, I didn't. And so um, I'd love for you to kind of share that with, with everybody. Well, if you can imagine, if you have a 16-year-old in your house, um, and a lot of the Christian families, they've had their kids there uh, like we did since you were two weeks old. All four of our children, by the time they were two weeks old, that tells you something about your mom. <laughs> we had our kids in church uh, in, in there. I was 16 years old before I ever went to a worship service. Hmm. I never owned a Bible. In fact, uh, I think the first Bible that I ever owned was, uh, was a Bible that uh, some guy was going door to door and Becky bought it during the day. Uh, and so uh, even, even after I was saved when I was 16, uh, and I was just a 16 year old boy going back to the same family, the same school, the same friends, the same streets to run. I, I didn't grow any, I wasn't reading my Bible. Uh, I didn't know much about it. Uh, and, uh, and then God began to do some, some things in my life. And, uh, my dad was a hard worker, uh, but my dad, uh, had his own issues. He liked to drink and, and, um, and, and we just went through some real, real difficult times there. Uh, I was the captain of the basketball team on high school. My dad came to one game. He was a sports fan. He watched all the sports on TV. I played Little League Baseball all from the time when we, back when you had to make the team. They only <laughs> kept two nine-year-olds and I made the baseball team. He saw me play at nine. I played all the way through till I was 12. He never saw me play after that game. Hmm. Uh, of course, I, I played basketball in college too. My dad came to one game. Hmm. For a long time, I also, I, I just kind of felt like, you know, what's wrong with me or dads don't do that sort of thing. I wasn't mad at him because I didn't know that's what dads did, hmm. uh, that they cared about things like that. So uh, I, just, uh, I just went through those years, had no direction, no leadership, no, no guidance, never had a sit down talk uh, like this with my dad about important things in life, never had a serious conversation, never heard my dad say he was proud of me. Hmm. Uh, never never had a, a, a real friendship with him. never told him I loved him. Uh, he never told me he loved me until I was 42 years old. Wow. Uh, and, uh, that was my mom's doing. My mom was sitting there at the table and Becky was at one end, dad, and mom come down to visit us. And, uh, and I, 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 that was bothering me. And I, so I said, you know, uh, in the conversation we were talking, I got it into that. And, uh, I said, well, you know, I've never told dad that I love him. Hmm. 
And this is the way my mom was. Well, she said, well, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's the first time I ever told him I loved him. Wow. You're, you know, what, what's it like, you know, going into a, a family where now you're learning about God, you're learning about being a father and you're learning about being a leader, but not having seen that model to you Mm-hmm. Was that intimidating? How did you figure it out? What, what would you tell a guy <clears throat> sitting at home saying, that was my dad, what do I do? I can't go to seminary, so tell me, what do I do? <laughs> yeah, well, what motivated me was I wanted that. Okay. I wanted a relationship with him. I, I, I had a great relationship with my mom, but, uh, but it wasn't the same as, as with my dad. I wanted that, and, but I didn't know how to have it. Mm-hmm. But my prayer was, Lord, I, I, I never prayed, God, give me money or give me a big house. I never prayed about things like that. Uh, my prayer was, God, give me a godly family. Hmm. And, and that's what I was after. And that, that's what I desired from God uh, to be able to do that. And so I'm preaching and, and I'm reading the, the commentaries and I'm learning about that. But shortly after uh, uh, I got out of seminary, uh, I, I went to, um, uh, to a marriage conference. I heard about a marriage conference that was in Cincinnati, Ohio. And, um, and I went down there by myself. <laughs> but Becky didn't want to go and she was busy with the three little kids. Playing and all softball. That. So yeah, playing softball, <laughs> some other very important thing. And, uh, and I sat there and I, and I took notes and I thought, this is what I have been looking for all my life. Hmm. This was it. And, uh, and I, I literally went back to my church and the next week I wrote a letter to, that, to the guy who was in charge of all of that. Mm-hmm. And I said, this is what I've been searching for and what I believe God's calling me to do. I said, I want, I would love to be able to be one of your teachers. Hmm. And uh, he never responded to me. <laughs> Uh, and so I just said, and that's when I started doing marriage conferences. Okay. I used his materials and mm. still have his books. Yeah. You know, Weekend to Remember, mm. you know, and I still have that. And, uh, and, I, and I started teaching those and I'd have like 30 people from the church. <clears throat> and every year for over 30 years, I did a marriage conference with the church families. And I didn't do it for really for the church. You were doing it for I yourself. Did it for me. <laughs> And you know, it worked, hmm. uh, it worked. I, I learned how, I not only learned how to be a father and how to be a better husband, which I had a lot of need for <laughs> along the way, cause I didn't know. I was, I was totally ignorant of what it meant to be a, a husband or what it meant to be a father. Cause I'd never seen that example uh, in front of me. And yet I learned, and as I learned and I meditated, as we've said, mm-hmm. upon that, I began to put it into practice. Yeah. And over a period of time, I saw, and that's why I'm so committed to God's word, because I know that there are guys out there that are worse than I was probably, and as ig- more ignorant than me maybe, uh, than I was. I'm here to tell them, God's word works. It produces miracles. Mm-hmm. Not three months after you, you, your wife says she's going to leave you maybe, but, uh, but he, over a period of time, you do what God tells you to do and God will give you the desires of your heart. Mm-hmm. And so when I look at my life, I think, gosh, I should have dreamed a little bit more because <laughs> everything I've ever dreamed of, everything I've ever desired, God's given me. Mm-hmm. And I didn't pray for it. I just, I just prayed that God would help me be the man, the father, the, the, uh, the husband that he, and son that he wanted me to be. And God gave me all the rest just as an extra benefit. Yeah. Well, it worked because you've been a great father and I appreciate you and I love you and thanks for being here today. And, you know, I, I just know that there's probably some dads out there and you're like, well, my dad was a lot like... Ron's dad, you know, uh, what do I do? And, and uh, I want you to know that there, there's hope for you today. Uh, just like God taught my dad how to be a dad, he can teach you as well. But it's gonna take dedication and learning. It's gonna take what he's talking about here, applying the word of God uh, to your life. So the message from Psalm 1 is clear. It's come to faith 
in Jesus, first of all, because it's his word, it's his truth. He died on the cross for your sins. He, he wants to give you new life. He wants to give you a blessed life. He wants you to be a blessed man. And so that's first and foremost. And then, and then he wants you to then uh, begin to commit your life to the word of God. Know it, live by it, treasure it. And the result is gonna be a, a steady life, a fruitful life, a prosperous life. Live for the Lord and, and uh, for that, uh, you'll be successful. You're gonna live life and receive the, the gift of eternal life. And for a lot of dads out there, you might think you're just too far gone for God to save you. And on this Father's Day, you might be a son or a daughter and you might be thinking you're too far gone for God to save you now. But let's remember who our heavenly father is. Let's remember that no matter uh, if you have a godly father or you have an ungodly father, your heavenly father loves you perfectly and will always welcome you home. Uh, For too long, I think we approach God uh, just to get happiness in a certain situation. And we miss the whole relationship here. The result of this life in Psalm 1 is that God would know you. Um, We think all we need is just the feeling of happiness. And uh, that's not true. Uh, You need need a a relationship with God. Uh, So we don't want to come to God just to get something from him. We want to approach him as your king today submitting to his authority and, and, and giving him authority over your life. And when you do that, you'll start to experience his blessing. Uh, remember the story of the prodigal son. The son asks uh, for his inheritance and then he spends it all on wild living. And then one day after he'd spent all his money, he was broke, alone and eating from a pig's trough. And he came to his senses and he decided to go home to his father And uh, the son comes home to the father, but he doesn't say, hey, dad, I'm back. What can you do for me uh, to make me happy? No, he he approaches his dad like he's a king. And he says, I've sinned and I'm here to serve you. And when he comes home with that attitude, the king receives the son like a father. And he turns from a king Mm -hmm. into a father and he welcomes his, his son home. I wanna encourage you to stay tuned and and listen to this next song and and let uh, let the words of this song preach a message to you, a message of the Father's love to you. And if you need to make a decision today, if you want someone to pray with you or you're ready to give your life to Jesus today, I wanna encourage you to text the number below and someone will connect with you and help you any way that we can today. Thanks for tuning in today and happy Father's Day.